Nephew community, and welcome to today's episode of Hot Topics in Nephrology podcast. My name is Sushma Shervante. I am a nephrology medical science liaison with Otsuka, and I will be moderating today's discussion. It is my pleasure to introduce Melanie Betts. Melanie is a registered dietitian, certified in renal nutrition, and specializes in kidney stones. She spent six years at the University of Chicago in the section of nephrology, where she worked primarily with CKD, PKD, and kidney stone patients. She has since started her own business, The Kidney Dietitian, to help patients and other healthcare providers better understand nutrition for kidney stone prevention. Her research interests include plant-based diets for kidney disease, understanding adherence to renal diets, and effective nutrition interventions to prevent kidney stones. You can find her at www.thekidneydietitian.org. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. As are we. Today, we will be talking about oxalates, what it is, what type of foods oxalates are found in, their role in kidney stones based on the available data, other dietary elements that play a role in kidney stone formation beyond oxalates, and what all of this means for patients with kidney disease, including patients with polycystic kidney disease. So to start off with a little background, Melanie, I'd love if you could provide some context for our listeners, starting with what is an oxalate? Yeah, so we'll start out with the basics. <laughs> so oxalate is just a molecule that is found exclusively in plant foods. Um, oxalate is not in any sort of animal-based food. So it's, you know, things like dairy and meat and fish and seafood have zero oxalate. Um, but basically any plant food is going to have some oxalate in it. Of course, there are some foods that have more oxalate in it in them than others. And we'll certainly get into that a little bit later. Um, but know that it's just a molecule that occurs naturally in plant foods. Um, it does nothing for human health. So we know that plants are good for us for lots of reasons, but this particular molecule doesn't have any role for us. Um, it does have a role for plants. Apparently I'm, I'm not a plant dietitian, <laughs> but my understanding is that oxalate has something to do with, um, plants protection mechanism or something to ward off intruders, something, something I'm honestly not, not really sure, but for us, it has no no role um, for human health, and it is found in plants. That is super interesting, and you know, thank you so much for that context and that background. And now that we have a better understanding of what an oxalate is, could you tell us a little bit more about how oxalates impact the kidneys? Yeah, so this is a complicated question, and I'll I'll try to you know kind of simplify it down for a podcast. Um, but basically, if oxalate gets too high, it can crystallize, and typically it crystallizes with calcium, and it's those crystals that can hurt kidneys. This is typically how kidney stones are formed. Um, and kidney stones are more likely to be formed when there's a whole bunch of different stuff going on. And one of those things that could be going on is high urine oxalate. Um, typically kidney stones or these crystals are formed when there's too much oxalate or calcium. And I will say um, that typically um, high calcium, high urine calcium is more the driving factor for kidney stone uh, production. Um, but certainly if urine oxalate gets too high, this can form kidney stones. Um, and also just those, even if it doesn't get to sort of a kidney stone situation, there can be these sort of crystals that we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about PKD, but these crystals can damage the kidney tubules. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's not like oxalate alone can impact kidneys or our health, but it's really these oxalate crystals that are forming with calcium that really can give us trouble. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that important context. Now, because of these implications on kidney health, it's important for patients to be aware of oxalate consumption in their diet. So on that note, what type of foods are typically higher in oxalate? 
Yeah. So remember I mentioned earlier that oxalate is exclusively found in plant foods. So again, all plant foods essentially are going to have some oxalate, um, but the ones that are especially high, some of the red flags when it comes to oxalate are things like spinach, almonds, rhubarb, beets, and navy beans. Um, I will say that there's actually no definition of what a high oxalate food is. And one of the things that I hear from patients and people online all the time is that they feel so frustrated about trying to limit oxalate in their diet because you will find endless and conflicting food lists from what we as healthcare providers give patients as well as what they find online. Um, and so, you know, and that's that likely there is so much conflicting information out there because of lots of different things. Um, one of them is that there's no definition of what a quote high oxalate food is. So those foods that I just limit, just listed are incredibly high. Like those ones are, um, especially spinach is literally seven times higher in oxalate per serving than any other food on the list and almonds about twice. Um, but there really is no definition. So me, I may say, you know, I'm just kind of making this up, but I may say that a high oxalate food is something that has more than hundred milligrams per serving. And someone else might say it's more than 20 milligrams per serving. And so because there's no definition of what this high oxalate food cutoff is, that is one of the reasons why there's been this massive confusion and all these conflicting lists is too hot what high and low oxalate foods are. Um, the other thing that that has led to all this misinformation is that it's really honestly impossible to know exactly how much oxalate is in food. Um, it's not very commonly measured and apparently it's very difficult to measure. Um, I'm certainly not a, a chemist. <laughs> I don't understand those uh, ins and outs, but uh, my, from my understanding, it's difficult to measure and the way that we used to measure it may not have been the most accurate. And so it's just kind of led to this mess of information um, that, that really is very, very frustrating for patients. Another issue is that um, things like uh, nuts and greens and beans, some of them are on the higher oxalate side, but there's huge differences in different oxalate and the content, and excuse me, in the oxalate content of different greens and different nuts and different beans. And so a lot of times uh, doctors may say like, oh, you know, avoid all greens, nuts, and beans. And that really doesn't need to be the case if someone even does need to follow a low oxalate diet, because there's just specific nuts and specific beans that, that are much higher and oxalate than the others. Um, and so all this being said, uh, that a, a strict low oxalate diet, um, if someone is trying to limit oxalate to say 50 milligrams a day or hundred milligrams per day, those are kind of the two most frequently used definitions of what a low oxalate diet is, at least that I've seen. Um, this will uh, eliminate or at least significantly reduce all of those greens, nuts, and beans, um, all whole grains, um, many vegetables and some fruits, and also many plant proteins. So um, I know that was not a very direct answer to your question. <laughs> it's really hard to answer that, but know that a, a strict low oxalate diet will significantly limit a lot of plant foods since that's where oxalate is exclusively found. And no, I thought that that was a great answer. I can definitely see how all of that information can be very confusing and very challenging for patients to digest. And I'm very glad that we are breaking down this dietary oxalate topic today. So hopefully it's insightful and helpful for patients. Um, I think that transitions us nicely, though, into a review of the literature. Um, there's a paper titled The Relationship Between Modern Fad Diets and Kidney Stone Disease, a systematic review of literature by Yazid Barguthi and colleagues. And the bottom line up front is that it isn't just about oxalates, and you did touch on this a little bit earlier, but essentially we can't talk about oxalates in a silo, but there is a balance between oxalates and other dietary elements like calcium, magnesium, and more. Um, so in their paper, Barguthi and colleagues note that dietary patterns that increased urinary oxalate but maintained urinary calcium levels didn't affect the risk for kidney stones, but dietary patterns that increased urinary oxalate while decreasing dietary calcium, that actually increased the risk for kidney stones. So I know that was a little bit confusing, but could you elaborate a little bit more on the calcium oxalate balance for our listeners? Absolutely. And this is such an important point, if not the most important point. <laughs> so if, if you get nothing from this podcast, please remember that when it comes to oxalate balance, dietary calcium is actually 
probably much, much more important than how much oxalate someone is actually consuming. And the reason is um, really the calcium that we eat, dietary calcium, will bind with the oxalate that we eat in our intestines, and it will block the absorption of oxalate into our bodies. Um, And so we see in study after study that people who consume diets that are adequate in calcium and dairy, those diets are significantly associated with a lower risk of kidney stones, all because of this gut handling basically of calcium and oxalate. Um, Yet I will say that um, I spend a lot of time talking to lots of people online um, in my my business these days. And I consistently hear people telling patients to cut back on calcium for kidney stones because, I mean, that makes sense, right? Like calcium stones are by far the most common type of stones. What makes sense that, hey, maybe we don't want to eat so much calcium, especially if you have high urine calcium, but that is actually incredibly harmful advice. We actually, even for people who have high urine calcium, want to be getting enough calcium in naturally from food because that is consistently associated with a lower risk of stones because of the reduced intestinal absorption of oxalate. And I will say that um, dietary calcium is not, it, it does raise urine calcium a little bit, but it doesn't nearly as much as supplemental calcium. So for the vast majority of people who have sort of your standard calcium oxalate stone, we really want to be trying to get calcium from natural food sources and not supplements because it's not going to raise that urine calcium as much. And it's going to do a ton to help reduce um, oxalate absorption in the intestine and therefore reduce urinary oxalate levels. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all that great information. The paper also touches on the relationship between oxalates and magnesium, as well as oxalates and phytic acid. What can you tell us about these other elements and how they also impact kidney stone formation? Yeah. So this is one of my favorite topics. I think it's fascinating um, because really, as we touched on earlier, kidney stone prevention is about so, so much more than oxalate. And I often say that oxalate is the least of my concerns when it comes to kidney stone prevention. Um, And these things, this, uh, the magnesium and phytic acid are two of the things that I think are most interesting um, and things that we don't necessarily think about when we are instructing patients on what to eat to prevent stone. So um, these these things work in slightly different ways. So magnesium can bind to oxalate and that forms an insoluble complex in the gut and that's eliminated in the feces. So therefore magnesium can also reduce the absorption um, and excretion of urinary oxalate and dietary phytic acid or phytate um, reduces the ability of calcium to bind to oxalate in the urine. So basically both of these, these compounds that we can find in our food make it so that calcium and oxalate are not available to bind to each other and prevent kidney stones. Um, so these things I think are really, really interesting, relatively new, sort sort of new, um, on the scene when it comes to kidney stone nutrition research. And I think, um, it may be a huge reason, probably magnesium and phytic acid, and probably honestly, hundreds of other compounds that we're not even aware of is why we consistently see a lower risk of kidney stones in people who consume, um, dietary patterns that are ironically very high in, in oxalate Um, because phytic acid and magnesium specifically are found in the exact same foods that would be severely limited on a low oxalate diet, specifically um, whole grains, leafy greens, and nuts and seeds. Um, These are foods that we typically want our patients to be consuming for health generally, and even kidney health generally. And I would argue that maybe even kidney stone health, because they have these, these other things in them, phytic acid, magnesium, and and like I said, probably lots of other things, alkali, potassium, all sorts of stuff that we know is generally good for stone prevention. Um, So I mentioned that these dietary patterns that are higher in plant foods are associated with a lower risk of stones. And the two patterns specifically that I've seen most in in the literature are the DASH diet and Mediterranean diet. So these dietary patterns that are marked by fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, right? Like these are foods that are um, are higher in oxalate. So these dietary patterns are just inherently going to be higher in oxalate. These things are consistently found to have, to be associated with a lower risk of stones, despite that higher oxalate content. And I really think it, there may be a lot to be said for these sort of off the, off the charts, lesser known things about all the good things that are in these plant foods that are probably doing a whole bunch for us from, for a kidney stone prevention standpoint. 
That's so interesting. And I know it sounds contradictory, but when you actually get into the details and examine the science behind it, like you nicely explained, it does make a whole lot of sense. And um, I think it's important for patients to have this full picture. Um, to that point, it's also important to emphasize, and you did mention this earlier, that not all kidney stones are actually caused by oxalates. And you know, you're a big advocate for personalized care, as I believe all providers should be. Um, so to that effect, how do we determine what the cause of a kidney stone is in an in individual or very specific patient? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's so important to know that there are different causes, even for the same type of kidney stone. You know, I, I get people asking all the time, oh, I had a kidney stone, it was analyzed and it was calcium oxalate. So what should I eat? And my response is, I really can't tell you until I know what caused that calcium oxalate kidney stone. And there's lots of different things that could be causing that same type of stone. And the the only way that we can know is a 24 hour urine collection um, that has ideally a complete sort of kidney stone panel. Um, and, you know, this is going to measure things like urine oxalate, urine calcium, urine citrate, urine volume, your magnesium, um, pH, right? All of these things are going to be either working for or against someone when it comes to stone prevention. And what is going on in that urine test is really going to dictate what I, as their dietitian, would tell them to change in their diet. So um, other things that might come up are, you know, things might trigger me to say like, oh, we need to make sure that you are working on getting in enough calcium, maybe eating uh, eating less sodium, maybe added sugar, maybe, maybe avoiding too much non-dairy animal protein. There's lots of other things that, that are usually more the culprit in my experience for stone prevention than, than oxalate. Um, most of the time it's high urine calcium. That's really driving that stone formation. And so we're really, really going to be honing in on sodium and the right amount of that non-dairy animal protein. Um, and even if urine oxalate is high, I will say that eight times out of 10, if we just get enough calcium in that person, urine oxalate comes tumbling down and we don't need to take away or even limit a lot of these very healthful foods that are on the higher oxalate side. That makes sense. And so then once we have uh, more personalized information on what the uh, composition of you know a particular stone and a particular patient is, um, what do we do with that information? So what are the next steps? And based on your clinical experience, in which type of patient would you say that a low oxalate diet is potentially beneficial? Yeah. So I'll, I'll refer to what the official American Neurological Association guidelines for the medical management of kidney stones say. Um, and they recommend limiting dietary oxalate only for people who have high urine oxalate on a 24 hour urine test and who have confirmed calcium oxalate stones. Um, they also recommend making sure that that person is getting enough calcium, as I mentioned earlier, to inhibit oxalate absorption. So basically, I think mon uh, reducing dietary oxalate makes sense for people who do continue to have high urine oxalate on a 24-hour urine test when they are getting in enough calcium. Um, that being said, I think there's a lot of confusion um, and certainly no consistent definition of what that low oxalate diet means. Um, and I will say that I never recommend a specific amount of oxalate to target. So I would never tell someone to eat, say, 50 milligrams of oxalate or even 500 milligrams of oxalate for that matter, just because it's simply impossible to track. It is literally impossible to know exactly how much oxalate you're eating or even honestly guess for many products that people are eating because it's simply not on nutrition labels and companies don't pack. Like we, we just really don't know. And so instead I recommend sort of just taking stock of what that patient is eating and reducing those very, very high oxalate sources. Um, nine times out of 10, there's some sort of big red flag. Like this person is maybe on a gluten-free diet and they're eating a lot of almond based products. Well, yeah, that almond flour in the bread and the crackers and everything that they're eating, like that's adding a lot of oxalate, or maybe they're having a spinach salad every day for lunch, or maybe a spinach smoothie, or maybe they are snacking on cups of nuts throughout the day. Um, so usually there's just like a few changes that we have to make like that. And just making those changes with enough calcium is enough to get that urine oxalate down. It's, it's not giving them this, this list of high and low oxalate foods and saying, quote, follow this list. It's more about working with the patient and sort of looking at what they're eating and, and modulating those incredibly high sources of oxalate. 
You actually, now that I think about it, have a really nice post about kidney stones on your blog. And you talk about a lot of the things that we've discussed today in your blog, um, and especially talking about how emphasis or saying how restricting oxalate in the diet in patients where oxalate restriction is not appropriate might actually have the opposite effect and make kidney stones worse. Because even though low oxalate diets lower urine oxalate, it might not be for everyone, as you mentioned, for example, if the kidney stones are not caused by oxalates, and two, it limits all of these other good things like alkali, magnesium, and phytate. So, um, and we've, t we've talked about this um, quite a bit, but the harm of taking away these beneficial things potentially outweighs the benefits of a lower urine oxalate. And this again, highlights that we can't just isolate oxalate without taking into account the balance between oxalate and all these other dietary elements and how they play a role altogether in kidney stone formation and prevention. And so then when we're thinking about patients that are looking to adopt a more kidney friendly dietary pattern, what are some specific dietary trends or patterns that maintain this oxalate balance, not specifically restricting or lowering oxalate, um, but maintaining a balance between oxalate and all these other elements? Um, are there specific dietary patterns that are more favorable um, in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, especially for those people who don't have a history of kidney stones, I, as you sort of alluded to, I really wouldn't worry about oxalate. Instead, I would make sure that you're getting in enough calcium. So the recommendation is three servings of calcium rich foods per day. And that's actually consistent with the dietary guidelines for Americans, like what all of us should be doing for general health anyway, for bone health and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's something that I would really think about. Um, and this is also part of the DASH diet as well, um, which has been associated with those favorable outcomes in terms of both chronic kidney disease and kidney stones. Um, the other thing I would think about is making sure that you're drinking plenty of water, making sure that you're not um, eating a ton of salt, as many of us are in the United States, at least. Um, these, these are things that, that are part of the, uh, you know, general guidelines for Americans anyway. Um, I would definitely encourage plenty of plant foods. So at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, thinking about lean proteins and even plant proteins. Um, the only thing that I might uh, if you are worried about stones or oxalate in general, is just avoid sort of binging on those very high oxalate foods. So spinach tends to come up the most just because there's spinach in a lot of things. And spinach, as I mentioned earlier, is legitimately seven times higher in oxalate than any other food. So a half cup of cooked spinach has around 750 milligrams of oxalate. And almonds, which also are high, have around 122 milligrams of oxalate per ounce or like a quarter cup or so. So spinach is just a really big one. And so, um, you know, if you're having that spinach smoothie or a spinach salad or spinach in your omelet or and and right, if these things are adding up throughout the day, like it definitely adds up. So just kind of be mindful of those really big ones. But other than that, I, I really wouldn't worry about oxalate. That makes sense to me. And we talked about oxalates in terms of dietary patterns and foods. Um, for example, you mentioned spinach and almonds, but are there certain cooking techniques that can impact oxalate ingestion? Yeah. So um, any sort of cooking method that involves water will reduce the content of oxalate in the food. So um, especially when that cooking method includes heat and water. So boiling something is going to reduce the oxalate content by about half, um, but also something like steaming um, or soaking is going to reduce it a little bit as well. Um, however, this is not something that I routinely recommend um, because this also reduces the content of all other wa water soluble vitamins and minerals. And honestly, that food's overall nutritional profile. So it's not something that I recommend, um, but technically <laughs> uh, uh, boiling spinach or potatoes does reduce that oxalate content by about half. Definitely. So again, highlighting that we don't want to get so laser focused on removing oxalates that we end up washing away, um, you know, or removing these other beneficial nutrition simultaneously, but um, that there are options for patients um, in terms of how they cook their food and how it can impact oxalate levels. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to take a quick detour here. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, general chronic kidney disease patients, and I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about patients with polycystic kidney disease or PKD. 
Um, so a low oxalate diet is often recommended in patients with PKD because there is some data that oxalate crystals can aggravate PKD. Um, could you elaborate for our listeners a little bit more on the recommendations for oxalates and patients with polycystic kidney disease specifically? Yeah, and this is certainly a really interesting area of research, PKD. There's a lot of really interesting uh, nutrition research certainly going on in the PKD space right now. And I think the key to your question is that we know that those oxalate crystals can aggravate P PKD, but where is the data that shows that a low oxalate diet improves that or that a high oxalate diet exacerbates it? Um, I would argue, honestly, that that higher oxalate dietary patterns, such as a DASH diet or Mediterranean diet, are actually associated with better outcomes in PKD. Um, so again, we, we know that those oxalate crystals exacerbate PKD and accelerate that disease progression, but that same issue comes up. Um, we, we really have no data to, to know if that low oxalate diet improves these crystals or slows the progression of PKD. Um, we do know that people with PKD are at a much higher risk of kidney stones as well. Um, about 60% of people with PKD versus only 10% in the general population. So that's a huge difference. So, so kidney stones are definitely a concern and, and honestly, probably everyone with PKD. Um, so I think we should be thinking about the same things for people with PKD when we think about uh, uh, general kidney stone prevention, right? So making sure to drink plenty of water, which is key to that's uh, PKD nutrition 101 anyway, <laughs> um, making sure that we're avoiding too much sodium, eating the right amount of protein, I mean, eating just more plant-based foods. We know these things are beneficial for kidney health in general and PKD. And so when we add this low oxalate restriction on top of all of this, it could really make following a lot of those things that we want them to do much more difficult. And we're really cutting out a lot of things that might actually help kidney stones and crystals. And we're not even sure if that low oxalate diet is going to help. And so I think we just need to know a lot, lot more about how dietary oxalate impacts PKD and those crystals and disease progression before I would feel comfortable recommending a, a blanket lower oxalate diet for PKD. This has been a lot of great information. Um, if our listeners wanted to dig even deeper into the topic of oxalates and how it impacts the kidneys, what are some references or resources that you would recommend? Yeah, so there really are not a ton of kidney stone references out there, which is a lot of why actually I started the kidney dietitian in the first place. Um, I would recommend the University of Chicago kidney stone blog that has a wonderful both physician and patient facing side. So there's a ton of information there. Um, my website, the kidneydietitian.org also has a lot of information on it um, about kidney stones. Most of that is patient facing, um, but I did recently release a kidney stone training training for dietitians and other healthcare professionals that you can find um, on my website as well. Wonderful. Well, we are eager and very excited to see what you come up with next in the world of nutrition and kidney health. And Melanie, thank you so much. This has been so informative. We appreciate you greatly for spending your time with us and sharing all this wealth of information and knowledge and your expertise with us once again. Nephew community, thank you so much for tuning in. Please check back for future episodes where we will talk about other hot topics in our nephrology podcasts. And until then, please do check out the abundance of incredible resources, including several nutrition-focused materials available on nephew.org. Melanie, thanks again. Thank you again for having me.